Good morning, Converge Community Church. Uh, I come to you from, most recently from Dearborn, Michigan. That's where I'm originally from. Uh, my wife and I and our five kids have spent the last six years in uh, Lebanon. That's the country of Lebanon, not Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, and uh, lived in Beirut for a year and then moved down to the far south. We were right north of the Israeli border for a few years and then uh, moved to the city of Tyre, which is mentioned many times in the Bible. Uh, Jesus went to Tyre, Paul went to Tyre, and uh, and we went to Tyre. And uh, so uh, now we're uh, planting a new church called Christ Community Church. Uh, So we'll have to see what kind of CCC logos you guys come up with and maybe borrow those from you. Uh, I'm going to put this right down here, and that will give me more space to wander around and flail my arms and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so we're planting this new church right in the middle of Dearborn. Does anyone know anything about Dearborn? Like, kind of like half Catholic, half Muslim. And we're planting ourselves right in the middle of that. And we'll see what God does. Because we saw God do some great things <clears throat> in Lebanon, which is very much similar uh, situation <clears throat> religiously. Um, so we decided that, that we'll call this a commencement to uh, admission emphasis month, okay? Commencement, like uh, when you finish your four years of high school, you have a commencement. You, everyone's talking about how you've finished. You're at the end of high school, right? Well, commencement, what does that mean? It means beginning, right? <laughs> it's the beginning of the rest of your life. So let's look at the uh, commencement of a month of talking about missions with the beginning of the rest of your mission. Okay, we're, we're, this, is, this, is, this is just the next step in, in the mission. When we talk about missions, what are we talking about? In a nutshell, what we're talking about when we talk about missions is God's kingdom, okay, expanding. What's God's kingdom? Is there a castle and knights and a moat and everything? No, it's, uh, it's people. God's kingdom is people. It's people who... Uh, submit to God, love God, but most of all, glorify God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And anytime someone trusts in Jesus and, and, and glorifies God in that way, they become a part of that kingdom. And so the expanding of, the, of God's kingdom is just more and more people coming to know about God and about His Son, Jesus Christ, and all that He did for them, and being identified with, with that king, that group of people, that kingdom, submitting to the king, who is God. And uh, if God is doing that, if, that is his, if that's what he wants to be done, then he's got a plan for that. He's got a means for that happening. He, he's not just kind of left it to chance. He's actually ordered it, and he's actually got a job description for those people who are part of that kingdom on how they should do that. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 17. Uh, You can just stick your thumb in there right now. That's on page 793 in the Bibles and the seats there. And uh, we're going to talk about the way that God did this according to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, which is after the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell about the story of Jesus and all that he did on the earth before his death and resurrection... The book of Acts continues that story. It's actually written by the same author as the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. So it's like it's just like the sequel. Okay? It got a little confusing when Star Wars came out, when uh, you know George Lucas decided to make three movies like 20 years after the first three movies, which were actually about a story that happened before the first three movies, and we were all confused. He started talking about this prequel stuff. Okay, this is back when sequels were sequels. Okay, when first things came first and second things came second. First, Luke wrote the gospel about all that Jesus did, and then he starts out the gospel of, or the uh, the book of Acts, talking about all that Jesus continued to do. He continued to do it, and he did it through his followers, who we call the apostles. Uh, one way that I, I like to help myself remember this is to use the title of a little book. Um, how many, uh, my dad has a little thing he likes to say. He says, yeah, I have lots of books in, in, on my bookshelf. I, have, I only have two left that I haven't colored. 
And, okay, that's my dad. That's the kind of things he says. Um, <clears throat> maybe they don't translate from generation to generation. I don't know. My kids just groan when I repeat dad's jokes. Uh, but I, my, in our family, we had lots of board books. How many of you have had kids in the last 20 years or so? I had little children in the house, at least within the last... I, my oldest is 16. My youngest is 8. We're kind of past the board book stage. I really miss those. You know, they were, the pages were so easy to turn, and, and they were so short. You know, you could just finish it up and then go to, go to bed. But now it's like chapter books. And, uh, you know, got done. I took like four years to read the Lord of the Rings trilogy to my kids, you know. Um, anyways, uh, board books. One, one board book we had on our shelf, everyone should have this on their shelf. It's a must read. Is the Berenstein Bears Inside, Outside, Upside Down. Inside, outside, you know, I'm nodding their heads. You know, you could probably recite the entire book, right? Inside, inside a box, upside down, okay. So anyways, uh, this little title, though, is a neat way of remembering how God uh, began to expand his kingdom in the book of Acts. If we look in the, in the first chapter of Acts, we see the apostles kind of hiding out. They're inside. They're nervous that, that the same authorities that had crucified Jesus would now be coming after them. And, and Jesus even told them, just stay in Jerusalem, wait till I, I come and bring power upon you. And they weren't really sure what that meant, but they obeyed Jesus and they stayed put and they were mostly meeting in an upper room. Maybe it was the same upper room that they had the Passover in before Jesus died. We don't really know, but they're hiding out there and, and they're in the gospel, the kingdom was kind of inside. It was kind of in hiding. But then something amazing comes. Uh, in chapter 2 of Acts, we read about how uh, it was a Jewish holiday called Pentecost, and it was 50, wor uh, 50 days after the Jewish Passover. And all the Jews from all the different uh, countries from all around the region came to Jerusalem for that holiday, and they spoke lots of different languages. And all of a sudden, in the middle of that celebration, the Holy Spirit comes down on the 12 apostles, and they, well, there was 11, there was a new one guy who was voted in, so, because uh, Judas was out, so uh, it was about 11. But there was one new guy there, so we'll say 12. Uh, so 12 apostles, and the Holy Spirit was coming down on them, it, it filled them, God's Spirit filled them, and they began to, like, preach. They began to speak out, and what was coming out of their mouths was... The gospel message, the message about who Jesus is and what he did for us, and people were hearing it in their own languages from all around the... It was a miracle. It was a miracle. And God was expanding his kingdom in that way. Now, the gospel, that message of, of God's kingdom was going from inside to outside. Now it's becoming now. Now it's hanging all out there. And Peter is speaking just uh, completely... Uh, without hesitation. The same guy that had denied Jesus just a little while before was now preaching to 3,000 people and 3, 000, more than 3,000 people. 3,000 people of the, huge, of the larger group came to believe in what he was saying. The gospel message had gone from inside to outside. And then we, uh, we see Peter meeting uh, non-Jews, Gentiles, and by chapter uh, 10 and 11 of Acts, we see the gospel going beyond just talking to Jews, not just people who had already known about God from the Old Testament. That was their Bible at that time. Now, now people who had no background at all in, in the things of God from the Old Testament at all, they were coming out of worshiping idols. They were what they called pagans. Okay, and, they, and, and they, uh, they had no clue about these things. But now they were beginning to hear this message too. And they were beginning to believe. And then God saved this guy named Paul. He's riding on his horse. This guy was an enemy of the church. He was trying to drag people out of their homes to have them killed. To have them thrown in jail just for following the teachings of Jesus. And God knocks him flat off of his horse as he's riding up to Damascus. And he calls him to follow him. Now he becomes a believer. And now he's preaching to both Jews and Gentiles. To the point we get to chapter 17 in Acts. And he arrives in a town called Thessalonica. Which is over in Greece. And something is said about Paul and his companions by the Thessalonians. In chapter 17 verse 6. They say these men, meaning Paul and his companions who have turned the world upside down, have come here also. The gospel 
the kingdom of God, the message of God, expanding the kingdom of God had gone from inside to outside to turning the world upside down. That's where we find Paul in chapter 17. After Thessalonica, the people kick him out of there. They didn't like his message. They got mad at him. They ran him out of town. He went to Berea. The Jews there accepted what he said, but the Thessalonians came over and made trouble. They followed him to the other town and started making trouble for him there. Finally, they take him, his companions take him to Athens. Now, everyone's heard of Athens. Athens, Greece, with the Parthenon and all of the ruins, okay? In Lebanon, we have very similar ruins from the Greek Roman Empire period. Uh, but no one wants to go to Lebanon for some reason to see them. Uh, they much rather go to Greece. Now, Greece would love to have you come and spend your money there. They need that. Uh, so if you have a vacation, you know, go to, uh, and some money, go to Greece and spend your money there. They, they'd love to have that. Uh, you know, Lebanon could use the, um, the, the income too, but you probably don't want to go there uh, given what's going on next door in Syria. Tangent. Okay, so here we are. Paul is in Athens. And he arrives there. Now, I've traveled a lot all around this country, all around the world, and usually when I arrive in a place, I like to go see the sights. I like to go see what's there, not Paul. Well, Paul goes and sees the sights, but he's not there as a tourist. He's not there as a tourist. He is on a mission. He has got a message. He knows that message is powerful. He knows it changes people's lives. And he wants to tell it to as many people as he possibly can. So first he goes to his, his kin. He's, he's from a Jewish background. So he goes to the synagogue. And then we'll read the scripture and see what he does from there. Let's look at Acts chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to read all the way to verse 34. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of scripture. But you know, there's power in the scripture. I like to read it all. I like, and you get the feel of the story of what's going on. Okay, let's, let's see what, what it says. Verse 16 in chapter 17, page 793. Is that what I said? Yeah. 793 in your Bible there. Now, while Paul was waiting for them, meaning uh, Silas and Timothy, that's, he had gone by himself and he was waiting for them to join him, uh, waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked, it says, within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. He wasn't on a summer holiday. He wasn't on vacation. He decided to spread the gospel message. Verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher, foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Oropagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Oropagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. As I have passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind, uh, all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, uh, God overlooked but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, meaning Jesus. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, 
we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, the Europagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let's just say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we just read your word. And that's not just the words of man. Those come from your mind and your heart. And they are inspired in the heart and mind of Luke to write it down for us. It's there for a reason. You've passed it down to us. Uh, let us stand under it. And let us be changed by it as we explore what it means for us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Athens, famous city. It was then, it is now. Why was it famous then? It was already famous by the time Paul got there. It had been famous for hundreds of years before Paul got there. It was known for its rich philosophical tradition. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, okay, all those guys that were, were in Athens. And that's where they continued to be studied for hundreds of years. They were still, these Epicureans, these Stoics, these were branches of thought that came from the original guys, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And they were kind of variations on the themes of those philosophies that were established hundreds of years before Paul ever got there. It was known for its literature and its art. I mean, it was a classy place. It was known for its religious uh, traditions as well. It was just, it was just a, it was the Athens of Greece. <laughs> How else do you describe it? Think of Boston. You ever been to Boston? That's one of my favorite cities. I mean, it's just, it's got art, it's got history, it's got MIT and Harvard. I mean, it's just this place where things happen. There are leaps and bounds beyond the rest of us. Just, if you want to know where the Midwest is going, just think about what, look at what they're thinking in Boston. It's going to go that way, okay? That's, that's just kind of the way it happens. It's, a, it's one of those epicenters of art and, and thinking and innovation and probably, like Athens, under the surface, there's a whole lot of religious stuff going on that's not glorifying God, the one true God. In fact, there's probably a lot of idolatry going on. We'll talk a little bit more about what, what I mean by that uh, in this present context that we're in. But Athens was renowned in that day for these things. One guy uh, named Petronius wrote, it was easier to find a a god in Athens, with a little g, a god in Athens, than it was to find a man. There were altars everywhere. There were statues of gods that people worshipped everywhere. Now, in the Middle East, you don't see that much because Islam, basically, it was a message against the polytheists, against the idol worshippers. So you don't see that. But I have seen it in other ways. I've seen it in Detroit. I had a friend from high school take me once down to the Hare Krishna temple in in Detroit, and they had statues behind glass, and they were like washing these things and putting food in front of them, and the food would rot, and then they have to take it, you know, they're not eating the food. And these things can't bathe themselves. And yet people were bowing down to these things that they had made with human hands. Acts 17, 16 says that Athens was full of idols. The word there for full actually means swamped. It means it was just overflowing. Talking about Boston, have you ever heard of the 1919 Great Molasses Flood of Boston? Have you ever heard of this? This big giant molasses tank broke in 1919 in the north end of Boston, and the, and the molasses came flooding down the street at 30 miles per hour, and it killed people. <laughs> it killed people. I'll never say slow as molasses again. It just doesn't, you know, <laughs> molasses is fast if it's coming down the street at you, okay? But it was swamped. And they say on a hot day in the north end of Boston, you can still smell molasses today. Urban uh, legends, I guess. But, you know, it was just, it, you mentioned this icky goo everywhere up to your knees. You know, it was like three feet deep at some point. This is, a, this is the swamped, this is a picture of being swamped. Only it wasn't molasses. It was idols. Everywhere you turn, someone's, bowing down to a statue and not worshiping the one true God. What was Paul's response to this? Well, we have this kind of polite word in the English, at least in my version here, it says he was provoked. 
within him. His spirit was provoked. What does that word mean? It means he was jealous for God and his glory. That he, he, was, he was mad. He was upset. And he was thinking, if you only knew the joy of knowing Jesus... If you, you were created to worship God and you're bowing down to something you made with your hands. How crazy is that? That's what it meant, provoked. Okay, it wasn't just like, oh, I'm provoked. Okay. And when Paul was provoked, something had to happen. So, you know, we look around and we, we don't like the politics or something. Or we, we don't like what the newspapers are reporting. Or we don't like the... The, what's going on with the economy, or we don't like what, what people are doing with definitions of the family, or we, whatever it is, and we complain about it. We complain, and complain, and we complain. But with Paul, that provocation that was inside, went outside, and then it turned his world upside down. And that's the way it should be with us. When we see things that aren't in line with the message of, of the gospel and the truth that God created us to worship Him and to give Him glory, and that's the most important thing that anyone could do with their lives. When we see that happening, when we see that people aren't doing what they were created for, it should provoke not just to kind of complain and become whiners. We should want to let that gospel message that changed us inside, on the outside, share it, tell it, proclaim it, and watch God take that and turn the world upside down. Paul said in Romans 1.16 that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is power. I don't know how it works, but he says if you, if you tell the gospel, you tell people the message of the gospel, and you, and you say it clearly, and they understand it, that there's power. There's something the Holy Spirit does, and it changes someone. And it changes them, and then they, all of a sudden they become part of that kingdom. And that kingdom has become bigger because they put their trust in the one the king sent to expand his kingdom. That's Jesus. I mentioned the gospel. We talk about the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the good news? What is it, what is it in a nutshell? In a nutshell, it's this. It's that God created us all for a relationship with him, but not just a relationship of love, one that glorifies Him. We were made to be like the moon, reflecting the light of the sun. We were to be reflectors, mirrors of God's image or in his, and His glory back to Him. But we read in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis that that's not what ultimately happened. Adam and Eve turned away from that purpose. They sinned against God. They didn't obey Him. They didn't reflect His righteousness and His glory back to Him. And from that time on, everyone was born in this condition of being an enemy to God. And now what's happened is that God has decided that the only way to make things better, to fix that problem, that the people he created for his glory, for a loving relationship that are separated from him, to make them reconciled now, to make them come back to their purpose of being in a loving relationship with him and glorifying him again, was to come down and take the punishment he declared that that sin deserved in the first place. See, before Adam and Eve ever sinned, he said that when they did it, it would bring death into the world. That that was the punishment. And not just dying, but dying forever and ever and ever separate from God. And that breaks God's heart. And so he came himself as the person of Jesus to take that punishment on himself. That's what happened in, in the cross. And so we make such a big deal about the cross. Jesus was killed on the cross and he took all that punishment that we deserve. All that punishment went on Jesus and all his righteousness and sinlessness and the, and the glory of God that he gave back to his Father goes on us. And now the relationship's restored. Now we're back to where we, we were supposed to, where we were made for. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's what, that's what Paul would have proclaimed to these people. It would go from the inside to the outside. And when that's proclaimed, it changes people. It's God's design. It's His power. It's His plan for how to make His, his kingdom expand. And He could have done it some other way. I guess, you know, people say, well, why didn't He just make everybody, you know, love Him and glorify Him? Just like that. I don't know. 
He's decided to do it this way. He's decided to use us, to, to work through us, just like he did with the apostles. Jesus is still at work, just like he was in the Gospels, but here in Acts, he's working through the apostles. And you know, the book of Acts is one of those books, it's not over. There's a church planting movement out there called Acts 29. Acts ends at, 20, at 28. We're Acts 29. We're the 29th chapter. Okay, we're the ones that are still doing this stuff. And his kingdom continues to expand. So what was Paul's approach? What did he do first? First he goes to the Jews. That was his custom. He always went to the synagogue first. Okay, and then he finds himself out in the marketplace. So then he's out in the marketplace. Who's in the marketplace? Now Jews are in synagogues. Who's in the marketplace? Everybody else. Everybody else. Everybody got to eat. Right? So everybody's in the marketplace. And he just starts interacting with everyone who's there. And he waits to see who is God going to, you know, provoke in their spirits some kind of response to what I'm saying. That's how this gospel thing works. You just put that message out there and see who God begins to draw to that. Who did he draw that day? That day, it was philosophers. Most people hear philosophy. Oh. Sorry, I was a philosophy major in college, and uh, I just did a master's in Islamic philosophy, and I like philosophy. Philosophy's kind of cool, because it talks about, like, the most basic primary things. Where do we come from? What's, how do things go from nothing to what we have now, and, and, and what's the nature of humanity, and all this stuff, okay? And how do we answer those questions? Well, Paul started to get into this stuff with these guys. Who were these guys? Luke tends to spend a little bit of time with these different groups, after the Jews, he goes and, uh, and he works, um, he starts talking among these guys that they are called the Epicureans and the Stoics. I won't go into it, but a whole lot. But these philosophers, these Epicureans, these, they were, uh, they believed that the gods, plural, they believed that they were gods and the gods were remote. They had nothing to do with our lives. Ever met somebody like that? They believe in God and they say, yeah, you know, God's, I imagine that there's a God out there. But he has nothing to do with my life. That's what the Epicureans were kind of like, in a philosophical way. They were like what the Enlightenment era would call, in the Renaissance, they would, would have called deists. You know, God just kind of winds up the clock, he created everything, and he just kind of let it go and goes and takes a nap or goes on siesta or takes a cruise or something. Okay? That was the Epicureans. They didn't believe in judgment. They didn't believe that they had an afterlife. They didn't believe that, that God was going to judge anything. So just kind of live how you want. You know? Because there's no judgment at the end of the day. Look what Paul would say to them later. He, he preached judgment to them. He told them that, yeah, wait a minute, there is a God and he's going to judge you. Now let's go to the Stoics. What are the Stoics? They were called the philosophers of the, of, of the, uh, of the porch. This group had um, been around for a couple hundred years at that time when, when Paul was there. Now they acknowledged uh, one supreme God. They were monotheists, but in a pantheistic way, meaning like God was in everything. God's in the trees and God's... Now we believe that God is everywhere in the sense that he, he's not, you know, contained to one place or another. He can be everywhere at the same time. We don't say, but though, that, that the tree is God, you know, and the chair is God, and you are God, and I am God. We don't, we don't say that. That's what the Stoics believed. Everything, everybody was, was God. Okay? So Paul's bringing the God... Now, these, these philosophies are still around today. They're still here in one form or another. And we could list all kinds of other philosophers of that era. And their thinking is still being revived and just recycled and repackaged today. No different. And people say, well, these people today, people are resistant. Or people don't want to hear this or they don't want to hear Well, they didn't want to hear it then either. Some of them called, called, called them a, a babbler. The word babbler comes from the word uh, for, in Greek for pecking. Like a chicken pecks at seeds and just throwing bits of seeds all over the place. That's what they were calling what, What's this chicken squawking about? Is what they were saying to him. Okay, they were making fun of him. They mocked him. It's no different today. So let's look at what Paul did. What does he talk to him about? Well, he, he, he focused on two things. He focused on the Athenians' ignorance and their inconsistency. He was gentle about it. He was reasoning with them. He wasn't being mean. He wasn't thumping his Bible on their heads or anything, but he, was, he wanted to reason with them. And he started from where they were at. 
See, when, when he was with the Jews, he would quote extensively from the Old Testament. He would talk about how Jesus was the fulfillment of the expected Messiah that they were all waiting for. Well, the Greeks weren't waiting for a Messiah. They didn't know all that stuff. So he started with things they did know. So what does he start with? He starts, he looks at, uh, look at verse 23. He starts looking uh, at this altar. This, it's, it's, it's an altar set up, but there's nothing on it. There's no statue. And it says, to an unknown God. So he starts drawing their attention to this. And he uses this pagan altar to get their attention. But Paul's sermon was thoroughly from the Old Testament. He starts talking about, look, you, you, you're trying to cover all the bases. You think maybe you, you've missed one important one. Well, you have. You've missed the one true God, and let me tell you about him. He created everything. He's got a plan. And he goes on, he lists all these things about God. They're straight from the Old Testament, but he never quotes the Old Testament. He never drops the name of a prophet because it wouldn't mean anything to them. But he describes God in a, in, a, in a biblical way, according to what the Bible says about him. They admitted their ignorance by saying, we don't, there must be a God out there we don't know. He says, yeah, let me tell you about him. And so he shared it that way. You know, we can look for these cues in society. We want to share the gospel with people. We can look for these cues around us. What are these people saying by their lives, by the way they decorate their house, by the things that they buy? What are they saying about their beliefs? And can we begin to insert some, uh, some things about the gospel into our conversations around those things? And then Paul would point out their inconsistency. This is interesting. In verse 28, he says, he quotes from Greek poetry by a poet named Epimenides. In him we live and move and have our being. And then he quotes from another poet. He says, for we, we are all indeed his offspring. He quotes from Stoic poets. He says, look, you believe, according to your own philosophy, that we were created by God. And he wants to reason with them. Does it make any sense then? I mean, let alone what I'm trying to tell you. Does it make sense in your own system then to bow down to an idol? If you were created by a God, how can you make something yourself out of wood or gold or silver and bow down to it and call it God? It's inconsistent. You're not thinking. If you want a really good resource for a way to do that with people's thinking today, uh, I'd, I'd uh, tell you to get Tim Keller's The Reason for God. That's the name of it, right, Jeff? The Reason for God. He does a, a wonderful job at taking at the average person today, they're thinking about God and spiritual things, and shows them the inconsistency in it, and then draws them to a consistent belief in God through Jesus Christ and the message about Him. So he... He, he takes those things in their culture, in their, in their experience, and he draws them to the gospel. And then he, he preaches to them. Now I want to turn gears here. That's what Paul did. That's what Paul did. What's Paul's message to us? Because this is all Scripture. Not just what Paul did, but what he said. And this message applies to us as well. Well, you know, some of us might say, oh, well, uh, you know, his message was, a, was, was about idolatry. I've never carved a, a little statue and then bowed down to it and burned incense and lit candles and stuff. I'm not an idol worshiper. Is that the only form of idolatry there is out there? Is, isn't there possibly other more subtle forms of idolatry? Let me give you a little sentence and you fill in the blank. Oh, if I would, I, I would be happy if only I had blank. If I had blank... Oh, then I would be truly, you know, my life would be, would be full. My, my, I, you know, I'd, I'd really be fulfilled. I'd really, you know, I'd really be happy then. See, whatever you put in that blank, you have a temptation to worship. I, I'm being serious. To worship it. To give all your money to it. To give all your time to it. To give all of your, and to look to it to make you happy, to make you fulfilled, to make your life complete. What do you fill that blank with? Now, here's the tricky part. It could be really good things. It could even be things that are gifts from God. It could be gifts from God. God gave me a, a wonderful family. I love my wife. I love my kids. My, 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 the, the Lord has given me a marriage that just clicks. A marriage that works. 
We haven't had a lot of big struggles in our marriage. It's a good thing because we've, I've dragged my poor wife all over the stinking world. Okay, and that can wreak havoc on a, on a, and live in, you know, on ramen noodles and stuff sometimes. You know, it, that, that just can, that can, that can really, you know, impact a marriage. It's a gift from God. But I could make my marriage everything. I could make my, I could, I could say, Lord, oh Lord, don't take my wife from me. Because then I wouldn't possibly be able to go on. Really? Really? Don't, Lord, don't let my children go astray. Because if they rebelled against you, or if they went astray, or if they became something I didn't want for them to be, I don't know how I could go on. They're my happiness. We had a friend once. She was from Brazil. She's Lebanese, but she grew up in Brazil, living in Dearborn. And her father was dying. She told, she was friends with my wife. My wife had been sharing the gospel with her for many years. And she told my wife, she said, she said, Christy, when my dad dies, I will die. Now, you've got to know something about families in the Middle East. I mean, they're tight. They're really tight. But they're not supposed to be, like, that tight. Christy said, well, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll, no, 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 I will die. Really? I mean, she really believed this. I mean, that's extreme. But she really felt like she would, she would not be able to go on at all if her father died. That's not healthy. That's a form of idolatry. You've made your father out to be something he's not. You've, you, you're looking to your father to give you things that only God can give you. Only God sustains us. Only God should be our greatest joy, our greatest love, the, place where, the one in whom we find our greatest fulfillment. So that when things fall apart, when people die, my wife's father died last uh, December. And thank the Lord, and many, he was a believer, he really trusted, and we could celebrate the fact that he was going to be with the Lord. But yes, we mourned, and we cried. And I was asked to do the, the, the interment, you know, the graveside service. And I could hardly keep it together myself. Yes, we mourn. Yes, we cry. Yes, that, that's, that's normal. That's healthy. But we weren't looking to Dad for our fulfillment. We know He's gone to be with the Lord. We know that we will go on. We know that we have a Heavenly Father who walks through everything with us. And if it wasn't for Him, we wouldn't have been able to get through such a difficult time. He is our joy. He is the one who makes us happy. He is the one who gives us fulfillment. And when that happens in our life, when He is the one who receives all of our love and affection, not that we don't love our families, but we love Him first. Not, we, not that we don't enjoy our, our work or enjoy the nature and the trees and the, and the beauty that God's given us, but God has said throughout His Bible that all of that is supposed to reflect glory back to Him. We're supposed to love the giver, not the gift. And then we can enjoy the gifts more because if they come, if they go, if they're gone, we're still okay because our joy is in the giver, not the gift itself. Job said that. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He had his heart in the right place. When that's happening in your life, You've cast out those idols, and it's an ongoing process. We still, you know, you're always find, oh, there's another idol. Got to get rid of that one. Oh, there's another idol. Got to get rid of that one. That's Christian maturity. That's growing in Jesus, discovering the idols that you haven't knocked over yet. And God will be faithful to show them to you. And he will be relentless to rip those idols out of your life. It will be painful. And he will be, if you are truly a child of God, he will be relentless to get those out of your life because he wants to be your all in all. He is jealous. And he's the only one who has the right to be so because he's a loving, beautiful God. When we do that, when we're in that process of getting rid of the idols and putting the Lord first and foremost, that he is on that altar alone, then we're back to that purpose that we were created for. We're giving glory to God with our lives. And then it won't be a chore for that love of God to go from inside to outside and then turning the world upside down. It'll be our joy. It'll, it'll just come 
naturally, supernaturally, naturally. It will happen because that's where our hearts are. And out of our hearts will come that treasure because God is our treasure. So I challenge you to let the Holy Spirit do an x-ray, do, do an examination. Say, Lord, are there idols there? If I put something, do I love something more than you? Am I tempted to love something more than you? Don't let that get in the way. Let the Holy Spirit, and it will hurt to, to rip, rip those things away. But it's for our good, and it's for God's glory. It's the best thing for us. And in the end, it's, it's how the kingdom of God expands. Because we bring other people into that process as we share that gospel message. And then they start casting down those idols in their lives as well and putting God in His rightful place in their lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, uh, You are just that. You are our loving Father. And You deserve all praise all glory all of our lives every little square centimeter of our hearts you made us we belong to you Lord we forget that we forget it every single day forgive us for forgetting that and help us Lord to identify those things that we are trusting in that that are idols, that are little gods that cannot deliver us, little gods that cannot fulfill us, little gods that will leave us wanting and leave the gap hollow in our lives. And instead, Lord, through the study of your word, through the applying of that word to our hearts by your Holy Spirit, through aligning our lives with the truths of the gospel day by day, step by step that our hearts would be that mirror of your glory our lives, our, our choices, our actions the things we do and say would reflect the fact that you are the king of our lives, you are the one who is on the altar, you are the one that we look to for joy you are the one who is fully satisfying and you will deliver and you will keep your promises and you will be our Heavenly Father and you will be our husband as we are your bride, the church and you will be glorified. Help us to wear that on the outside to bring others in on that process to expand the kingdom of God. Start with me, O oh Lord. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.